Uh, but uh, this is a class, as I mentioned yesterday in worship, and maybe read the blurb. Um, the Bible wasn't written in English, and the phrase "lost in translation" in any language it, it makes sense. And so, what does that mean for us when we're reading uh, these these testaments that we hold precious and dear to us? So, I'm starting with a little. Um, Biography here. Uh oh, that's not good. Let's hope this works. Yeah, yeah. There go. Um, so I, I did the math. 50 years ago, I took my first language class. I took three years of Spanish, and I loved every minute of it. Uh, Miss Wales was a great teacher. I lived in Texas, so now when we went to eat Mexican food, I could order in Spanish. I could talk to the waiter. My mom was so impressed. I mean, it was it was a blast. It opened up a world, and I was always hearing it, you know, as a little kid. But now I could speak it and understand it relatively well. Uh, so I love language. But the first time when I, you know, started going to church at 19 years of age, and you, you know, it doesn't take that long to hear somebody say, well, the Hebrew word is, or the Greek word is, and you realize, okay, so this, you know, I didn't know it. I, nobody ever even asked me what language do you think the Bible was written in? So I started paying attention to that. But then there came a Wednesday night in the summer of 78. And the reason I remember it is that my life changed on that night. Um, I was a, I don't know, I guess sophomore in college and had finished that uh, second year. I was going to uh, be a coach and a teacher. And the Wednesday night Bible study was at our church and the youth person said, uh, do you want to come to our house for dinner before we go to church tonight? Well, of course, I'm not going to turn down a dinner. I'm in college. And so I go to their house. We eat. Afterwards, I was sitting on the couch, and he said, do you mind if I look over my notes, because we're doing a Bible study, uh, before we go? And I said, no. He came, he sat down beside me, and he had a plastic maroon-covered edition of the Greek New Testament. And I never really had thought about it until that moment, but I said, oh my gosh, could I look at that? And he said, sure. And he handed it to me, open. And in that moment, <laughs> I was called to ministry. I have no explanation for how that works, but I said, <clears throat> do you think God would let me learn Greek? That's what I said. And he looked at me like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what he looked at me like. It must have been an odd question. And I don't think it was the next day, but it was certainly within a day or two that uh, I went to the library and Crazily enough, they had a book on uh, New Testament Greek. And so for the next two years before I graduated from college, every week I learned three new Greek words, which I taped on the front of my Bible. So that by the time I got to seminary to take Greek, I already knew the vocabulary of the New Testament. Now, I had no grammar, no grammar. I knew nothing about verb tenses or anything like that, but I knew you know, everybody's going to start with the alphabet. Well, I knew all the words, so I had a big jump. I just loved Greek New Testament because, you know, whereas before I could order an enchilada, <laughs> now it was like, oh, my gosh, the Bible in its original language. This is so cool. Didn't try Hebrew until I got to seminary, but I was hooked. Um, and so for me, this is really, you know, a very... Um, I don't know, personal kind of topic. So we're going to start with place maps, though. <laughs> um, so a scholar friend of mine, one of my mentors, Tom Long, says that if you tell people, um, you know, this is the second Sunday of Epiphany, which comes in January, most people will say, okay, who cares? And he uses the analogy of if you're eating Chinese food with a friend and they look down at the placement, they go, oh my gosh, it's the year of the dragon or the rooster or whatever. You know, who cares, right? Uh, I'll come back to that in just a second. 
Second place map is harder to read. You probably can't see the blue very well at all, but it's got the Hebrew words that if you're eating breakfast, and Cindy, I'm gonna pick on you. When we were eating breakfast in Israel, there was a place, Matt, and beside the word good morning, it says Boker Tov. <laughs> and, and I would always say it to Cindy every morning, Boker Tov, and I still say it to Cindy sometimes. <laughs> And, and so it has these Hebrew words, right? So that when you're getting off the bus, you could say ta-da to the bus driver, you know, thank you. Or, uh, and so Hebrew placemats, all right? So it leads to this question, though. Tom Long's answer to what difference does it make if it's the year of dragon? Well, it makes a difference if you're Chinese. So his point being, well, it makes a difference if you're Christian. This is the way Christians tell time. Well, what I'm saying is, What's our native tongue as Christians? Obviously, we would say English for most of us, I assume, but I, I mean it more metaphorically. So just to kind of point out the obvious, God's first language is not English, <laughs> and it's not Hebrew or Greek for that matter, but the Bible it, it doesn't transcend all language. It comes to us in two languages primarily, and I mentioned the third there, Aramaic. But the First Testament, I, I kind of prefer that term, honestly. I'm trying to switch to just calling it the First Testament. Um, it was written in Hebrew. And the Second Testament, or the New Testament, is written in Greek. And then you get a little bit of Aramaic in, in both Testaments, actually, but more so in the First Testament. So here's an interesting kind of thing, though, to think about the three Abrahamic faiths have totally different views on this. In Islam, you can pick up an English translation of the Quran, but there is a great resistance to that. The language is sacred. In Judaism, the language is very much revered, such that even if you go to a reform progressive synagogue where they're trying very hard to reach people who don't have deep, deep, you know, roots in Judaism, even in that worship service, well, a lot of it's going to be in English. And the rabbi will say, turn now to page 27, and we're at the top. And then it'll be written in Hebrew. Sometimes in the Hebrew script, a lot of times transliterated into English letters. But you, you see what I'm saying? They're, they're translating it. But they're trying to hang on to Hebrew. So it's a, a kind of this middle. But Christianity, from the very beginning, it was in our DNA to translate. It's, it's just there in Christianity. And I, I think, you know, I'm just naming a couple of things here. One, the, the story of Pentecost, where Peter preaches, and they're hearing it in their own language. So you get that. Plus, Christianity, unlike Islam, and well, more so even unlike Judaism, doesn't really have a missionary impulse. If you go to the synagogue this Friday night or Saturday morning, <laughs> They are not going to say, are you looking for a synagogue? No. <laughs> we do that, right? Oh, there's one, there's one, get, get, get it. That's not, that's not how Judaism works. But Christianity, because it has this missionary impulse, and it was taking this to other parts of the world, well, then how are we going to reach these people? We're going to translate. And there's all kinds of stories of missionaries who went and did that, some of whom died doing it. So what I want to do is tonight just kind of help you appreciate the complexity of translating the Bible. It is incredibly complex. Second week, we'll look at some key Hebrew words. Uh, there's, a, there's a book out that came out in the last year called 70 Hebrew Words Every Christian Should Know. We're not going to go all through all 70 of those, and I've got some that aren't in there and so forth. But that's where I kind of got the idea for this. I was reading that book, and I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. Has anybody written a, a Greek one? No, they haven't. Uh, so I gave that assignment to David May, and I don't know if he'll do it. And then the bonus is I want to tell you about a revised translation of the Bible, uh, the new RSV or the NRSV UE, which is so clumsy. But that translation, the NRSV, is what we have in our Pew Bibles, but there's an updated edition, and I'll tell you more about that. Okay, so. A brief, very brief history of Bible translation. So the Jewish scriptures, that first testament, whatever you want to call it, 
these Hebrew texts were written roughly from 13th century to the 2nd century BCE. BCE just stands for Before Common Era. So instead of before Christ and after the birth of Christ, which is what AD stands for, it, it's a more polite way to include Christian and Judaism. Yeah. So BCE is the same as before Christ because it starts the same period. It's it's the same time, yes. So, so it's, it's the same time, it's just another term for it. It's more polite. It, yeah, it's showing that Christianity and Judaism exist at the same time. They have that era in common. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some now here's the irony though. Some of the oldest Hebrew manuscripts we have were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. What does that instantly tell you about translations of the Bible? That the newer translations have access to older manuscripts, which is kind of ironic. And there are, of course, ongoing studies of these manuscripts. So there, there's new stuff being discovered. And that does change translation. Now, when I say it changes them, we're not talking about, oh my gosh, it wasn't Moses after <laughs> all. <laughs> not that kind of change. But there are changes. The Septuagint abbreviated the LXX, right? Roman numerals for 70. The Septuagint is written in 2nd century BCE. It's the earliest translation of Hebrew manuscripts into Greek. And this is surprising for a lot of people, is that this is the Bible of the Gospel writers and Paul. Some would say the Bible of Jesus, that's debated, but um, there, there's some interesting things about this. One is the idea that, um, and this is legend, that the 72, they rounded to 70 to call it this, that the 72 translators, six of them from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, were sent off to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek because why does everybody speak Greek at this point? Alexander the Great, he Hellenizes the Mediterranean world. So even though you're a good Jew, you now speak Greek. And you read, you're, you're going to read your Bible in Greek. So he's going to translate. Well, these translators all worked independently and came back with the exact same translation. <laughs> uh, that ain't going to happen. But it is called the Septuagint because of the 70 that worked on it. Um, and so by the time of, of Jesus and Paul and, uh, and the gospel writers, this is how. And so when the, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's quoting it from the Septuagint. Not from the Hebrews, but from the Septuagint. And, and there are some differences, too. Well, did the Hebrew still exist? Then? Yes, it existed. Now, the language almost died out uh, in its history, but yeah, it did exist. Okay, so then, think for a moment. This is a little bit tougher, and you're probably really going to have a hard time reading this. But this little, this little fragment there on the left is written in Hebrew. And on the right, this is Hebrew as well. But the difference is these little bitty points and dots and symbols underneath the letters. These are vowel points. So the Hebrew, old Hebrew manuscripts didn't have vowels. And we'll talk about this next week, how Hebrew words are built on three letters, three consonants. But they understand, if you grow up speaking Hebrew, you don't need vowel points. You go, oh, yeah, I, if it has R, S, H, well, I know that was an A in between there and this one. But that, that's not always apparent because you can have two words that have the same three consonants but different vowels. So these vowel points are really helpful for people like me, for instance, when learning Hebrew. So this was written 500, 700 CE, so more recent. All right, so stay with me. Aramaic, this is the language Jesus likely spoke. And starting around 100 BCE, these Hebrew texts were translated into the most common spoken language of the time. And Aramaic is a, it's basically a Semitic language. It's a language from that part of the world. Syriac. Um, and people are kind of surprised to learn about this, but one of the early Christian centers 
is in Damascus, Syria. And so around 170, translation of the Hebrew Bible and then later the New Testament is translated into this language, Assyriac. And so there are people working on PhDs right now whose specialty is Syriac. And they're, they're doing manuscript work. The New Testament is written in what's called Koine Greek, which basically means a kind of street Greek. It's not classical Greek. It's not the Greek of the philosophers. It's more the, the Greek of the street. So these manuscripts that we call the New Testament appeared from roughly the middle of the first century. So like the earliest document we think is First Thessalonians. Paul wrote First Thessalonians around 50, 53, somewhere in there, up to about 105, maybe. We don't really know for sure, but somewhere around that Gospel of John, Revelation, somewhere in there. Um, and, and so these are the earliest manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And it doesn't look like this picture that I have here because it would have been in all caps. There'd be no spaces between words and no punctuation. So kind of like those old texts before you had the vowel points in Hebrew, that's the way it was with Greek. And so they, they made it easier for readers. Okay, so then moving out of more biblical times, the Vulgate, you may have heard this one before, Jerome translated the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts into Latin because this is now the language of the people. Well, this translation continues to have an impact on Christian vocabulary. <clears throat> Anytime you, you probably know this, when you see a word that ends in T-I-O-N, it's got a Latin derivation. Well, so words like salvation, justification, these are church words, but they're not Bible words. They're translations of Bible words from Latin. And Latin was a translation of Greek and Hebrew. Well, if something gets lost in translation from Greek to English, imagine what gets lost when you go from Greek and Hebrew to Latin to English, which we'll see in a minute happens as well. We're going to do a little quiz here in a second. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, Middle English, 14th century. You've probably heard the name Wycliffe. It's a very common reference to translators. 14th century, John Wycliffe translated the Vulgate into English. So now, English-speaking people have access, but what do they have access to? The Latin version. So we've gone from a Hebrew and Greek to Latin to English. This is obviously somewhat problematic. Erasmus, contemporary of Luther, brilliant, brilliant man. Yeah, he revived translations, though, based on Greek and Hebrew. So, for example, one of the most influential theological voices in the history of the church, maybe the most, is St. Augustine. St. Augustine could not read Greek and Hebrew. He read from the Latin. And his, some of his doctrines are considered questionable because of not using the Greek and the Hebrew, including, we probably should talk about this, in week three, including a translation out of which the notion of original sin comes from. Not totally built on it, but part of it. Um, by the way, when he did this, he was doing two things. He wanted to translate into Latin from the Greek and Hebrew, but he also wanted to correct the Vulgate. So while this version only has two columns, he had another version that had three columns. Original Vulgate, corrected Vulgate, because <laughs> he said bad Latin. And then, okay, here's the, you know, the, the translation. Um, Luther, we know his name, early 16th century, he translated the Vulgate into colloquial German. So he's working from the Vulgate, but it's the language of the people. It wasn't the high German. Uh, and this is the Lord's Prayer, for those of you who can't see that. Tyndall, 1530s translated from Hebrew and Greek into English. Now, when we say English, mm -hmm. can you read that? You can see the Gospel of St. John, the first chapter, but you notice not only is the script hard, but the, the spellings, it's that kind of old English. It gets a little bit tricky. 
And then, of course, most famously, the King James. 1611, it's mostly built on Tyndall's work, but it became the most widely read version for centuries. Probably still is the most widely read. And I had to brag here, although <coughs> I'm not bragging because it was a gift. Uh, <laughs> Phil and Patty blew me away. I, I still can't get my mind around this. They gave me a page, John chapter 3, a page from the first edition of the 1612. So the the very next year after the King James, it's just mind-blowing that, that it could even exist. So I mentioned this in RSVUP. So just kind of an overview. This is a very, very overview. 20th century, just some of the more popular translations. The Revised Standard Version came out in 52. New American Standard Bible. That was the Bible that I read when I came to faith. Um, 63, NIV 73, the new revised standard, the one that we have in our pew Bibles, it's, it's as recent as 1989, but now the NRSV UE. And so, of course, the question becomes, well, 89 to now, what's changed? And we'll talk about that. Okay, but here's what I want to say about this survey. It omits the price of translations. Wycliffe's body... It was afterwards, but it was exhumed and burned. And lots of others would die for even reading the Bible without a priest present. This is how the Reformation boils up. I mean, it, it's unbelievable that just the act of reading without a priest, but imagine the price paid for translation. So here's my observation on that. Like a lot of freedoms fought for, we now take them for granted, even ignore them. We, I at least, am appalled that you had to die and fight over such things. I think they would be that we no longer read it. And when I say we no longer read it, I mean, generally speaking, as a society, I don't mean you personally. Okay, so let me just pause there for a minute. Um, what are you thinking? What are you processing? Yeah, great. Uh, when these translations occurred, <clears throat> did did the people who were translating try to go back and get a, a better understanding? It wasn't just a word for word translation, was it? Right, right. Yeah, no. I mean, there. Yeah, we're going to talk about in a minute the the two different kind of approaches to translating, but yeah, they're trying their best to make sense of it. They're not just doing this word means this, this word means this, because, you know, there's rules of grammar that are different. Uh, Greek and Hebrew, for instance, the order of words is totally different. So they're trying to smooth that out. But anybody who's ever translated anything will tell you all translations are interpretations because you had to make a decision. What word am I going to use for this? And I remember, for instance, my Spanish is pretty good. And we did a trip to um, Nicaragua and Costa Rica at, at the seminary. And we're visiting seminaries there and we're talking about liberation theology. And the first couple of days, I'm waiting for the translation. You know, I'm picking up a few words. Uh, middle of the trip, I don't need the translation. End of the trip, I'm saying, well, that's not exactly what you just said, but you, you've made it into this, right? So they... That's the way translations work. And quite honestly, um, the earliest copies of manuscripts, you understand that before the Gutenberg press, the only way anything was done was by hand. So these Greek manuscripts, these Hebrew manuscripts, when they get copied, sometimes a mistake happens. Sometimes change is made. Don't like that. It doesn't fit our theology. Yeah. The vowels were added to the Hebrew. It, what's the thought about how much the problem that caused? Well, they're trying to bring clarity, right? Because if you have, I mean, we could find an example in English, I'm sure it'd be easy enough, where three consonants, a vowel in between the two, and here's a word, and here's another word, and we took out vowels, you know, that would make sense in the newspaper kind of thing. So it was trying to bring clarity to that. It certainly helped in seminary because 
Hebrew is extremely foreign to the mindset. So the point is that people do a decent job of putting that. Yeah. Out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Another thing is that different languages are built on different methods of thinking. Sure. I mean, subject, verb, verb, noun, that's great, but a lot of languages are right. circular. They don't go for A and B. Right. That's an example. Right. They're just built on a whole different yeah. mode of thinking. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, even if you just know Spanish, you know, you you say Casablanca, uh, you you know, it should say house of, and yeah, I mean, it's, German does that where there'll be a preposition at the end of a sentence that went back to this verb at the beginning. And, uh, pastor I, I know closely who is dyslexic found it much easier when he got into some of these old languages. Really? And reading the circuit. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I can't remember the author, and he's the one that spoke here on parables. Uh, Brandon. Oh, Brandon. Scott. Yeah, Scott. No, yeah. Uh, ben. Who are, are you talking about? Oh. Are you talking about Brandon Scott? No. Just recently. No. Oh, a long time ago. Brandon, well, Brandon Scott. Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his book talks about translating, and, and evidently there are Generally, you, what you try to get is the oldest manuscript, right? Because you think the oldest manuscript is going to be the most accurate. But the problem is that the oldest manuscript might <laughs> might have been copied, but there is a newer manuscript that was copied from one that predated right. the one that you have. Right. And so you never know for sure right. that if you have the oldest, that it is the most accurate. Yeah, and I think people are a little surprised to find out. Um, like David May's answer is, if he has, if someone says, well, what does the Greek say? Jokingly, he'll say, which Greek? Mm -hmm. There are different manuscripts. So, like, if you open a Greek New Testament, here's all the words up here, there's the verses, but at the bottom, there's this huge chunk of footnotes, and it's a critical apparatus that says, this manuscript and this one have this, this manuscript has this, and there are people whose total specialization is trying to deal with what's the best manuscript evidence. And there are, there are rules that people have come up with to say, here's a, here's a good rule of thumb for this. And, and, and it's, some of it's based on language and some of it's based on the politics of what was going on at the time. This idea of an impulse to translate. Yeah. It it brings to mind everything that Dr. Ben was talking about in the previous three weeks about our desire to claim things and claim authority over them. Mm. This idea that rather than using the original languages by scholars to understand, that idea of translating is to bring it into closer proximity with our views and values. Right. And I, I that's that might be uh, that could be one. I don't think there is any one impulse. I think there's sure. a range of sure. impulses, and it could be just for deeper understanding, right? Uh, rather than for some other. Yeah. Wouldn't it be interesting though if if Christian impulse wasn't to translate yeah. that going to church meant we read. Greek. <laughs> Which Greek? <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Um, the, the list of translations that you had up there a little bit ago, did they all, the people who translated them, all go back to the yes, same would, basic? Yes, things? they would have all, in the 20th century, everybody's going back to. Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. Yeah. They just have different philosophies of translation. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah. It, uh, is the King James much of it informed by the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts? Mm, it's, some of it is, but a lot of it is not. And a lot of it is based on not the best manuscript evidence. And, and so, People, you know, there are people out there that will die for the King James, and there are others that spend their whole life trashing it. I mean, the challenge is not just the manuscript evidence, 
But the other challenge, of course, is the, the, the meaning of those English words has changed. And so trying to make sense of it, besides the formality of it, but yeah, yeah, it's generally not the best manuscript evidence. Is it, is it accurate that, I don't know where I read this or heard it, but that King James insisted that things not be called, referred to as royalty or kings or- Yeah, I've heard that too. I don't, I don't know if it's true. Okay. Or not. I know he had an influence. Mike, I think where I kind of stumble on in addition to the translate, the translation is for things like the Apocrypha. What's not, what, what fell away in the site? So you have these translations and then the process in which the Bible became the Bible, right? That everybody's now kind of playing with the same, the same thing for the most part. Yeah. When we have this, these other documents that were translated and sure. chosen not to be there, right? Well, the NRSVUE has an addition of one I put up there, it has the apocrypha, it does it, pseudo And the well, one I carry has it too, but yeah. yeah this is been, can you speak up just a little bit? Yes. <clears throat> Here, I'll turn my ear ears. Well, I'm thinking about the people on the aisle that they I, well, I think I have something worthwhile to say. <laughs> but my take on it is that what is the inerrant word of God? We can just can't know. Well, I guess I guess the God's purpose of this is for me to engage my brothers and sisters. Christ and talk and think and debate, well, what is the will of God? Right. It's meant to engage us, not to tell us this is right. right. Yeah, I mean, that, I'm not going to chase the inerrancy rabbit, but. Oh, oh. Well, <laughs> because the inerrancy rabbit is this circular logic that uses the Bible to say that. And so, you know, it kind of, um, and, and plus, I'm still scarred from my days of being persecuted for that. So, okay, we're going to move on. <laughs> Principles of translation. What if I told you that the meaning of the Hebrew word is pronounced chesed, you got to do chesed, it's got to start in the back of your throat, is loving kindness. What would you say? Well, I would ask you, well, what is loving kindness? What do you think? Well, there are there are two words. There's loving and kindness. <laughs> they're not necessarily. Well, then, in this case, there's just one word: loving kindness. Right. So when you put them together, then it, it brings a whole new meaning to it. Okay. What does it mean? Well, I mean, I to love is to care for, and you know, and there's the seven Greek ways, you know, agape and eros and all that. So stuff. you think that's a good translation of passage? I don't know any Hebrew. I have no idea. I mean, other than, right. you know. See, and, and if I said, write down your translation of loving kindness, what does that word mean? Give me a synonym. And you wrote one down. Somebody else wrote down a different word. Different. Which one's a better translation? And what, if, and what if you don't mean the same thing by the same word? I, well, I, I'm thinking, you know, I, I if you gave me the word chesed in a sentence, I might have a better shot at it. Yeah. If you if you used it in a sentence, just like they do with the spelling bee for it. Right, right. Okay. But I, it, it's hard for me to say what loving kindness is because loving is one of seven things that the Greeks define. And kindness can often be interpreted by people as different things. Okay. For people who don't want um, people to become dependent, they say, you know, taking away all support. The tough love is, uh, is you right. know, tough loving kindness. Yeah, now see what you're doing there, though? You're coming from 21st century back. Absolutely. You're using tough love. You're using the language of sociology. And, of course, it wasn't written in... It wasn't written in English, and then they found a Hebrew word called hesed to say, right. right? It was written in Hebrew, and we're trying to figure out what does this word mean. Okay, so let me keep going. Other translations use faithfulness instead of loving kindness. What does faithfulness mean? 
full of faith, right? With the nest on the end. <laughs> um, and what if I told you that the Septuagint translates chesed as elios or mercy? Mm. What does mercy mean? And does it matter to you that the first two examples are English translations, but the third example is, well, it's an English translation of the Greek translation of the Hebrew, but do you care if one of them came from the Septuagint and the other came from Webster? I think I should care, <laughs> but but I'm not I'm not good enough with uh, you know I can speak French and I can speak English. Yeah, and I can do just enough Spanish to be in real trouble, you know, <laughs> in Guadalajara. But it should matter. Yeah, and I... it it sh it should matter when we think about reading any translation beyond the. I don't know, maybe fifth century, because we've expanded the use of words and we've expanded the number of words. Well, in this case, what's the difference between the English translations, loving kindness, faithfulness, and a Septuagint translation? Mercy and loving kindness to me seem very similar. I'm not sure that I would say that they are the same as faithfulness. Mm. Yeah. I'm Mike, but that's so you see, and, you, did you see the point that I'm raising? Yeah, I'm raising absolutely. a philosophical point, not a grammar point. Philosophically, what's the advantage that the Septuagint translators have? They know the Hebrew, and they're using this Greek. And, yeah, they're using this Greek. They're closer to the time and know the Hebrew and are looking for an equivalent. But it's going to get lost in translation because even if Elias is perfect, you don't know what Elias means. Unless I tell you it means mercy, but how do you know what mercy means? So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to just, you know, frustrate you. I'm trying to show you the complexity of it. it. It seems like the other thing is we all use words differently, particularly from what maybe from different parts of the country, or even different parts of the state or the city. Sure, sure. And there's no reason to think that people in Jesus' time or before Jesus' time didn't do the same thing. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here's, here's the question. How did you decide the meaning of these words? Well, we've already played with that. So philology or the study of language notes the difference between connotative, what I take a word to mean. When I hear mercy, this is what I think. Yeah, but what about denotative? What did the authors mean by Elias or Hesed? Um, and how could one decide what was intended? So along comes the Rosetta Stone, that, which before it was a, an app for learning language, <laughs> as a real stone. It was discovered in 1799, but it was written in 196 BCE. Okay, so why is this language app called the Rosetta Stone? Because the top two layers, these three languages that are there, are Egyptian. One's in hieroglyphics. One's in this language, a, a script, demotic. But the lower level's in ancient Greek. Well, the, the people knew ancient Greek, so they used it to be able to translate what had been unknown before, hieroglyphics. So that becomes a metaphor in a lot of places, actually, I was kind of surprised. It's not just the language app, but people will even use it in science. They'll say, you know, this uh, discovery at the uh, subatomic level was kind of the Rosetta Stone for us. It helped us unlock this. So it's kind of become this metaphor. So let me show you the Rosetta Stone in biblical language, the Septuagint. The Septuagint is really key, as it turns <laughs> out. So I'm going to just give you an example. We're going to take the word parable. What does it mean? What's a parable? What does that word mean? All right, so this gets complicated. Well, as it turns out, it's not an English word. This is one of those times we took a Greek word and we made it into an English word. We just 
spelled a little bit differently because the Greek word has got an O-L-E ending, but we just made it into an English word. We transliterated, that's what that's called. Literally, parable comes from a compound Greek phrase, to throw alongside. So balos is to throw, balo is to throw. And para, like paragraph or alongside. So, but that, that doesn't really get us very far because I used the example here of a butterfly, right? They're gonna start showing up here soon. And you wouldn't tell anybody, well, that comes from, you know, the word butter as in your refrigerator and a fly. No, that's not the way language works. So how does it work then? Well, parabole is used in the Septuagint to translate a Hebrew word, mashal, or the plural meshalim. But a mashal in the First Testament can be a taunt, it can be an oracle, it can be any dark saying or riddling kind of saying that's supposed to get you thinking. So parabole is using the New Testament as all kinds of things. Like, for example, this proverb, physician, heal yourself, that's a parable. Now, most of us don't think of that as a parable. Uh, it can be a riddle. How can Satan cast out Satan? That's a parable. It's called a parable. A comparison, this is the one we know the best, right? This is where we kind of think of parables. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of God is like. And so it's the language of a comparison. And then there's a contrasting kind, too, like when Luke tells about a judge doesn't fear God or people. Well, we're not supposed to hear that as God. It's a contrast. God's loving, not like the unjust judge. So the point that we're really getting to here is a parable, parable A, like a mashal, can be said to be a flexible word. There's a wide range of meanings. So then you have to do the hard work of context. And that is what translators are having to do with everything. Now, you could say, well, why didn't they do it with parable? Right? I mean, they, they cheated. They just made it into an English word. They could have said, sometimes we'll translate parable A as riddle. Sometimes we'll translate it as comparison. Sometimes we'll translate it as, because it's capable of meaning all those things, just like the shawl is capable of meaning these things. But they didn't do that with the word parable. So going back to, I think somebody raised this question. Here's the two kind of different approaches, generally speaking. There's called formal equivalency, where you try to go word for word as closest to the original. I'm not saying they go in the order. They still respect grammar, but they're trying to get at word for word as close as they could possibly get to what a word meant. Dynamic equivalency is more the thought stressing I want people to understand this because they speak English in the 21st century or whatever. So the New American Standard, much more formal equivalency, NIV, more on the dynamic side. The NRSV is trying, and the UE as well, to be more in that middle ground. They're going to try and be as literal as they can, but also have some freedom in order to be able to make sense of it for English translators, English readers. All right, so that's the sweet spot. Uh, one other thing just to throw out there, we have to distinguish translations from paraphrases. Uh, the Living Bible, that's a famous one in the 70s. The Message more recently. Uh, my, my standard approach is, first of all, when one person's gonna do the whole thing, that's a little bit problematic. Although there are scholars who've tried to do the New Testament by themselves, but they're doing a translation. Paraphrase is much more about colloquial expressions. They're, they're not worried about words in the Greek as much as the idioms of our day. So the, the one I put here, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You'll recognize that. The message says you're blessed when you're at the end of your road. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. There are so many problems with that. <laughs> but it's a paraphrase. It's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. Uh, I'll show you just a couple of things. 
that are, that are neat unpacking here. So if you're a translator or a paraphraser, <laughs> I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. If you're a person trying to paraphrase, you've got to take every single thing in this and try to make sense of it. So what word are we going to use to translate this Greek word that we've translated blessed? Well, you see what Peterson did with the message? He changed blessed to you're blessed. That's not the same word. That is not the same word. Um, notice also poor in spirit. Well, he has at the end of your rope. That's really not too bad. Now, the Greek has nothing to do with the rope. <laughs> but it really does mean someone who has come to the end of their resources. They have no hope. So that's not too bad. I mean, it's again, it's a paraphrase. It's not close to the Greek. Interestingly enough, or which is in the NRSV and kind of implied in the paraphrase because that second sentence is a kind of explication of the first, but four is not a good translation in the NRSV. The Greek word that's used there should be translated because, and that changes everything. It's not, well, you're blessed because you're poor in spirit. You're blessed because yours is the kingdom of heaven. And even that phrase, well, let me, I don't want to skip this one. Notice what he did in the message. Who's he talking to? You individually. He didn't translate it y'all, but the Greek is y'all, not literally understand. I'm, I'm using in, uh, Texas Greek there. And then kingdom of heaven. So what does that mean? Well, it comes from Matthew, which is his way of saying the reign of God or the empire of God. The basileo to theu is the Greek. Well, how do you translate that? Well, some people like kingdom, and some people say, well, I don't like male-dominated language for God. And others say, well, empire would be good because it's probably a contrast with the empire of Rome. Heaven's just used because Matthew, with his Jewish sensibilities, doesn't want to use the name God. All that's there, but instead you get your blessed when you're at the end of your rope. The blessed of you, there's more of God and his rule. Uh, I don't know where he got the less of you part, but anyway. Okay. Um, another just quick example. How are we doing? Oh, my gosh, I got to get going. Okay, we're going to skip that. All right. Oh, what? Oh, oh, you want that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, don't get excited. Gird up your loins is not about genitalia. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It has to do with the robe, the, the outer garment that people wore. And to gird up your loins meant to pick up your skirt and run. So the way, if you needed to go fast, you'd hike up your robe, your skirt. And so King James says, gird up the loins of your mind, which is a really weird thing. Right, because it's a kind of mixed metaphor. Uh, so the revised English went, your minds must therefore be stripped for action. Okay, I guess. Uh, the message, so roll up your sleeves, get your head in the game. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. Uh, the new revised says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. That's probably pretty good because if we had said, you know, hike up your robe and get going, well, we don't wear robes like that, right? So this is just shows you how complicated. But see, you're disappointed. You thought it would be a yeah. Well, we'll do genitalia next week. And then we'll do I promise. Okay, we gotta keep going. This is a famous one, right? What did uh, Kennedy say? I'm a jelly donut. I've been telling Yeah. So the Ichfenheim part would have been fine, but Berliners, the people of Berlin don't call themselves Berliners. And so they have this nickname for a jelly donut. And he was trying, um, but it's just a funny example of what gets lost in translation. <laughs> so it is unfortunate that everything gets lost in translation. That is just the fact. So here's an example. The Hebrew word, and, and I'll bet you know how to say this, because remember, it's got to come from the back of the throat. Ruach, right? 
You're supposed to be spitting when you say this. It can be translated wind, spirit, or breath. And in Ezekiel 37, all three are used. So the Spirit of the Lord, if you read the passage, sets him down in the middle of a valley of bones. And the breath of the Lord, he, he prophesies to the breath. The breath of the Lord. What, where's the breath of the Lord? Remember Genesis 2? God breathes into this is This is God's breath. But it comes from the four winds. So in Hebrew, if you're reading this passage, you go, oh, this is such a great play on words. This, the Ruach of the Lord sets them down, and God's Ruach is blown into them, and it comes from the Ruach. Well, this, this works in Hebrew. It's missing in English. Now, I'll show you an example in week three of how some translators have tried when there's a word play to do this, but they haven't gained traction. They're not real popular. It's very hard work, too, because if you said, well, let's, let's come up with a word that can work in all three cases, and yet people would recognize it. It's kind of hard to do. Um, sometimes loan words lose meaning altogether. So loan words are words we didn't translate. Hallelujah is not an English word. It's a Hebrew word. And alleluia is not an English word. It's a Greek word. What's the difference between hallelujah and alleluia? Unfortunately, people messed up with Alleluia. Alleluia in Greek starts with a big alpha, just like it shows, but it has this little, what would look like a comma to most of us, and it's called a rough breathing mark, which means there's an H here. So unfortunately, I don't know who the culprit is, but somebody didn't know Greek. The, the Greek is Alleluia as well, but that got dropped somewhere along the way. This word, though, hallelujah, hallelujah, means praise the Lord. It's why it says hallelujah, yah, Yahweh. That's where that's coming from. So yesterday we read Psalm 150. It's real interesting. It says hallelujah, praise the Lord. They chose one time to translate it and one time to not translate it, it, it means praise the Lord. Um, words like ha satan, this is um, the Hebrew word for the adversary. Ha is the, the adversary. That got transliterated into Satan, capitalized even, and made into a proper noun. The First Testament does not have a capital S Satan figure that we would later merge with the serpent and with the devil. There is a Hebrew word for the adversary, and a whole notion of, of Satan develops over time, but it's really a, a mistranslation. Here's some of the other examples. Deacon is not an English word. It's a Greek word. They didn't translate it. They just literally kept it from the Greek. Angelos is a Greek word. We, we Christianized a little bit. And Christ, those are all Greek words. So the first one, if you were really translating diakonos, it would be a servant or a waiter. An angelos is a messenger. They didn't translate. It. So you get this whole notion of special beings. It's a messenger. And Christos is not Jesus' last name. It's the Greek translation of the Hebrew word of Messiah. And what's a Messiah? Well, I put here anointed. It, it literally means one who's smeared with oil. So we, we, we made some weird, interesting decisions of when to translate a word, when to leave it in its original. A lot gets lost in translation. Um, another example, the intensity and tense of verbs. So for instance, in Hebrew, in Isaiah, the wicked are described as ones who do not learn righteousness. So you have this Hebrew word. In Hebrew, that exact same word, although the, the to teach version of it, but it really could be translated the, the way the form that's used there is to really teach. It's an intensive. Uh, Piel, I believe, is the, the term there. Uh, another example in Greek, the leader of the synagogue said to the people, 
Well, that's not that's not best translation because the verb tense there is kept on saying. Greek has much more precision in its uh, verb tenses. So that gets lost in translation, unfortunately. Yeah. The word Christ, I think, Paul used that to refer to Jesus. So Paul is actually translating yeah. the case, right? Right. Yeah, and it's, I mean, but it's interesting. He uses a Greek word that would be the equivalent of Messiah, but how it becomes then a proper name, of course, happens over the next roughly 200 years. Yeah. Some of these examples that, that you were showing that the Hebrew it, it got mistranslated into Greek, did that all happen in the Septuagint? Um, some, but no, not all of it. Okay, yeah, but some of it. Okay, I want to tell you about this new revised standard. They make a point of saying that it's not a new translation. They're continuing. It's just an updated edition. So that's why they used that. They didn't come up with some new acrostic. Uh, the print version, I no clue why. It just keeps getting pushed down the, the road. It has to do with publishing because the thing's already out. I, I bought a Kindle version. You can go online and buy a Kindle version. Um, and, and I'll just show you a few things about it. Here's what they say. Their, their goal is accurate, readable, up-to-date, and inclusive. These are kind of the four markers on top of what they already cherished in translation. So these are just kind of um, qualifiers. So accurate. They're, since 89, we don't have new manuscripts, but we have new studies of those manuscripts. That's important. It's readable because style in modern English is always changing. Same thing for up to date, meaning of words change. And then it's probably its biggest thing is inclusivity. It's trying very hard to be inclusive. I wish they had been inclusive in more ways, but it's a step in the right direction. So let me show you just, these are just some examples. This one's not you know, an inclusive issue. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the East came to Jerusalem. Uh, and the NRSV will have a note translating it, telling you that the Greek word is magi. Well, the UE makes the decision to transliterate. Let's call them magi. But they have a note telling you a magi was an astrologer. And so, you know, there's, there's a little bit of progress there. They're not wise men. They're certainly not kings. <laughs> uh, another translation. This I one, we can't sing that carol anymore. Yeah, we three magi. <laughs> and, who's, and who said there were three? Yeah, that, there, there is no way to know. Well, all we know is plural, so there's two or more, and the three came because of the presence that they bring. Um, okay, so this one's, a, this one's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to sort of back up into it. Look at the middle here. They brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics. If I'm a paralyzed person, I don't want to be called a paralytic. I'm a paralyzed person. So what they did in the UE is say people possessed by demons or having epilepsy or afflicted with paralysis. So that's an improvement. Now, what they did, and I'm trying to show you up above, they continued, the NRSV did this, back in 89, the Greek word Adelphoi, which means brothers, they translated brothers and sisters. It doesn't mean brothers and sisters, but they know that in the first century, there were women in the church and that this included them. But, you know, as I used to tell my students when they would resist some inclusive translation, I'd say, you know, it was, it was usually a male. And I'd say, so you're, you're okay with it staying brothers? Yeah. Well, then let's just make it sisters. You, you understand sisters includes you too. 
they, they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but here's the problem, though, and I, I think it's interesting. So now we have this non-binary debate on sexuality and gender identity. But just last week, or two weeks ago, I guess, um, hosting Brian Ellison, who works with the Presbyterians on uh, full inclusion for LGBTQIA+. It's complicated because, as he pointed out, yeah, I get that. Um, you know, siblings instead, children instead of brothers and sisters, whatever. But he said, you know, women worked so long and hard to get included, and now you're going to use some term that doesn't name them. So it just shows you how complicated culture is, language is, and in this case, translation. One thing you can try this, and this is online, you can go home and play with this, Bible Gateway. Put in any passage you want, and then in the other drop-down menu, oh my gosh, you won't believe how many translations are there. Unfortunately, the UE is not there yet, but the NRSV is, King James, all kinds of translations you have never heard of. You'll be shocked. And you can just click and click and click and see the differences. And it's a really fun tool to play with. Is there a way to make it? Every time I open it, it comes up with the NIV. I know. There must be a default thing. It's like to. Now, the one, the one I use the most is actually a Ramus Bible browser, which is defaults new revised standard. Um, unfortunately, it's. British, so neighbor has got a U in it, you know that, <laughs> so, but you know, you can live with that. Okay, what are your uh, takeaways, any questions, and a fun one for next week, what Hebrew words do you know? It's very can, can enlighten us, but um, is your mind swimming or are you you're okay? I find it fascinating. I do too. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. Um, Brad Ehrman has written a whole book on this quote of Jesus. Right. And the That's argument good. is that frequently the copyists in the Middle Ages will change things to record their theology. Oh, yeah. I think that's accurate. Oh, yeah, it is. Definitely. So, yeah. I'll show you too, um, two weeks from tonight when we do Greek, I'll show you some examples where they, they clearly imported some theology. Um, and the, the tricky part of that is we would kind of, you know, shake our heads and say, but there were times when they meant well. Um, because all translations are interpretations. And, and so, you know, you, it, it's, it's just tricky. It's, that, that's one way to put it. There's some of it that's a little more despicable than others, <laughs> right? But there's always decisions that have to be made. Some of them more balanced. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about the UE version is that the, uh, the publisher went to the Society of Biblical Literature, Biblical Scholars, and worked for many years uh, intensively on revising this edition. So they weren't starting from scratch. I wish they had made a lot more changes, honestly, though. There's so many places where, and, and you've heard us say this on Sundays, you know, like, well, actually, the Greek means that they could have fixed some of those things, but it's just an updated edition of that new revised. But uh, yeah, we'll look at some examples. I wanted to say that I thought knowing Hebrew is essential because um, not knowing the Hebrew words, I have no idea what the Jewish religion really is and what their concept of what their religion is, like medras, as far as going through and looking at things and debating about things. That's their culture. Debate everything and see what falls out. And their whole connection with God is embedded in their language, which I do not know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you read any part of that First Testament, and you're reading a translation. And the same is true of the parables of Jesus, or the letters of Paul, or the Book of Revelation. You're reading a, a translation. Since the Korean is in Arabic. 
Are there issues of translation back to Muhammad? Do we have what's the earliest manuscript? You know? Don't know. Didn't study that. No, <laughs> that's, I was just curious if there was. If they I don't know. Words. I just know the sacredness of the language is very important. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed it. Learned something. <laughs> we'll, we'll tackle some Hebrew next week. Barry will correct me when I mess up, and uh, then we'll do some Greek. So, great time.